let's stand together. Are you proud? Come on, sing it with me. Yeah. Yes. Send down your love. Send down your love. Send down your love. Send down your love. Yeah. Send down your love. Send down your love. Oh, send down your love. On me, on me, on me. Oh, won't you send down your love? Send down your love. Send down your love on me. Yes. Hallelujah. Give the Lord praise. Father, we praise you in Jesus' name. Yeah. Yes, Lord. Wow. That's what I'm talking about. Lift your hands right where you're standing. Everybody say, I receive. Oh, you're not saying it. All right. If you don't want to receive anything, put your hands down. But those of you who want to receive something, lift your hands up. <laughs> and say up to me, I receive, I receive my, inheritance my inheritance in Jesus' name. In Jesus name. My, healing, my healing, my prosperity. My miracle, my breakthroughs, my victories, in Jesus' name. Now give the Lord a big clap. Hallelujah. I receive my inheritance in the name of Jesus. I receive it in Jesus' name. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Yes. Amen. And why shouldn't we? You know, God give you something, you're going to be shy, you're going to be apologetic, you get nothing. You get nothing. Year after year, you'll be the same. You must receive it, what He has given. I'm receiving it for 2015. Both my wife and I were believing God for this year and next year and years to come. Oh, we have dreams. The Bible says, Your old men shall have dreams. Yeah. I'm dreaming for great things. I'm dreaming and speaking those dreams into reality in Jesus' name. For property for Clang in five years' time to pay up our building in KL. By the way, thank you all. Thank you all for your great generosity and giving the way you have sacrificed. I'm believing and receiving to plant churches in the poorer areas of Malaysia in Jesus' name. Yeah, I'm receiving that. <laughs> I feel so pumped, you know, when I think about all the things that God has. That's why you, you never grow old when you have a dream. But you're always dreaming. Bible says He will renew your youth like that of the eagle. Amen. 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 Turn to someone and say, you're looking very young today. Amen. <laughs> Be seated. Hallelujah. Oh, yeah, yes, yes. Right, thank you. I want to start by saying that Jesus, listen carefully to this, because you, you need to hear this. Jesus isn't looking for people to admire him. He's not. He didn't come so that people will go like, Wow, oh, Jesus, you're so cute. <laughs> I'm sure people adore him and admire him. We worship him for who he is and what he's done. But he didn't come to be admired. He didn't come for people to like him. He didn't come for fans. He came for followers. I say again, he came for followers. He said, the servant is not greater than the master. If I went through this, you go through it too. Follow me, he said, I will make you, I will build you, I will reward you. So Jesus didn't come so that he could have a lot of people just follow him as fans. He would always turn around and tell them, now you're going to have to take up your cross. You're going to have to follow me. But I want you to know there's great benefits, he said, in following me. My father will give you the kingdom. 
Because you are my followers. Because my father loves me, he will love you. Okay. Now Jesus was a person who was very, very focused. His purpose, his mission, his vision. He says, now I want you to follow that. I want you to be caught up with, with what drives me. There are some things that drive people. You know, they are driven by certain things. Some people are driven by their ego. They, they want to be loved. They want to be known. Some people are driven by, by sensual things. You know, they, they, it, they, they just want to feel, taste. They just want to get into all that kind of things. And they're just driven by it. They say, I can't help it. I'm not condemning anybody who is driven like that. Some people are driven by wealth. I just need more money. I just need more money. And uh, of course, we all need money. Amen. We need money to, to, I mean, let's face it. You may be a good prayer warrior, but if you haven't got money, government isn't interested in your prayer, your prayer life. He wants your money. You pay your taxes, you finish paying your house, you send your children for education, all that costs money. And God knows you need money. Can you say amen? amen? And one of the things we are committed as a church is to teach you that God wants to bless you financially. God wants to bless you spiritually. We are committed to you doing well in your spirit, in your wealth, in your finances, relationally, in every area. And those are the things, that's our DNA as a C3 church. You know, it's your life, your best life that we are preaching and preparing our messages and praying for and that you will come into it. However, but what was the thing that drove Jesus? Again, he is for your well-being. But what I'm going to share with you, I pray, it will not just be a one-time message, but you will listen to it. If you can get on, on our website, listen to those messages and hear it in your car, or in your home, just in your free time, just Chew it through the week. What was the thing that drove Jesus? What was the thing that is the thing that pulled him? What is the thing that he wants our church to be driven? You know what it is to be driven. You know, you drive a car. The car is driven by you. You steer it in the direction you want your car to go. What drove Jesus? You drive a nail into a ground. You hit it the way, you place the nail where you want it and you want whatever you want to be nailed. Jesus is a driven person and he came with a drive. And that same drivenness must be in our church. What is C3 Church driven by? Are we driven by a political agenda? Are we PKR, DAP? Are we, are we, what are we? Are we a political church that every time we get upset by what's happening in the political world? Or do we pray about things like that and commit leadership to God? What are we driven by as a church? Some churches are driven by a form of godliness. You know, you've got to look holy. You've got to talk holy. You've got to pretend and go through. The Bible says it's a form of godliness. You're driven by that. Let's not mess that up. If we mess that up, you know, our forefathers built it for years. So this is how we are going to behave. They are driven by tradition. What drives our church? I pray that it will be more than just some of these things we've mentioned. We are driven by what drives Jesus. In Matthew chapter 9, and we're going to read the scripture together, from verses 35 to 38. It says, Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in the synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then says he to his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray, therefore, that the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers, into his harvest field. This was a very important moment in Jesus' life, and I hope you will get it today. He was driven by his love for people. Everywhere he went, he saw a lonely person, a person who could be a father, but he's probably now alone, divorced, broken. Maybe he was left by his wife. Maybe his contract. Jesus saw the suffering of a woman who was forced into prostitution because her husband left her. 
and she was just forced to go into this trade. He saw the persons who were addicted. He saw the persons who were broken. He saw those who were lonely. He saw those who had sicknesses and diseases. Yes, he saw the rich person, but he also saw the guilt on the rich person's face that he had gained a lot of his money, never thought about his health, never thought about his family, never thought about the life after or about God. And guilt is all over because he got his riches by every way he could. Yes, he also saw the Pharisee who was trying to be so pious, so hard, trying to please God. But there was guilt all over his face because he knew that he could not fulfill the law. Jesus saw all these things. If Jesus were to come into our church right now, and if he were to say, Church, I've got a bus, and I want all of you to get on it, and I want you to drive with me. I want you to drive with me through Pandamaran. At this time in Pandamaran, what do you think people will be doing? There will be a lot of the Bakute stores that will be probably filled by seven. Now it will be probably the chicken rice shops probably and some Konlomi places. Indians will be getting ready for the 50th Tose that they could eat. You will see people just carrying on ordinarily in life. But do you see how Jesus sees? He sees beyond what is outside. That was his passion. Nothing could deter Jesus. And today as a church, I pray that the Holy Spirit will anoint our eyes to cause us to see. You don't have to look at Africa and complain about what the Boko Haram or, or the Anaharams or whatever they are doing there. They, you can't go and do nothing about it, can you? Can you fly there and solve the ISIS problem that's going on in those kind of problems? The, the, the thing that you can do is to cross your street, to look around your office, that's all. What would Jesus see if he was in your hometown? In your street, in your office. You know, some people, they're concerned about things that are happening overseas. And, and uh, rightfully so, God bless them. They send funds, they send money to people who are supposedly doing work there. And God bless them. Yeah, that's wonderful. But I see C3 Church among the many churches that I'm involved in, Methodist, Baptist, that we are all trying to reach our people that are here. I thank God that our missions fund. Listen, whether you give or you don't give, we are financing because we are committed to give to our churches in Kappa who have no money, but they've got a great spirit. And they're reaching out to the poor. And every time I get a photo on Facebook by Pastor Magesen or his daughter or somebody, or by Pastor Subra, who preaches about four times on a Sunday, from Kuala Slango to Klang, and then he goes to another part, somewhere, I don't know where it is, Rawang. And then every other day, he takes care of, every Monday, he takes care of his mother, who is now very aged. And then on Tuesday onwards, they are running around, home to home, not classy cities. The Bible tells us that Jesus went to all the cities and the villages. Nobody was too small for Jesus. Now, when our church together with the C3 Church International. Some years ago, C3 Church, our leader, Pastor Phil, sat with all of us senior pastors. And our churches at that time was called Christian City Churches. And Pastor Phil sat with all of us. He said, guys, we're going to be changing it. Because we realize that a lot of our churches are not just in cities. If we are going to reach the masses, we have to get down to the mud huts. We have to allow people in shanty places. We have to go to the streets and the byways and the highways and all those lame people that Jesus saw. And we have to pick them up and bring them into the kingdom. So we're changing our church name from Christian City church and he did mention something funny he said many of the asian churches they cannot say city properly so they call it christian shitty churches and so he said that's got to change and so he changed that with a beautiful logo that people don't know what c3 church is you know people say what's that oh well it's just our logo that's how we identify because we realize that nothing is too small for the work of the church and the kingdom of god and i want to say that to you that when Jesus looks at people, I ask you, how do you look at people? You know, there was a time 
<laughs> and this is being recorded, but uh, I, I, I'm on very few chats. I don't have time to chit chat too much, but I'm on a few chats. One of the chats I'm in is with a group of non-Christians. Uh, they are some of my best real friends in the sense that I care for them and I love them. And anytime any one of them gets sick, I'll say, I'm praying for you. You know, like even today, they said, Joe, go pray for all of us. We are in the golf course, you know. <laughs> but you pray for us that we won't die of a heart attack. And I'll say to them, right now, I'm praying for you guys. And one of them did have a heart attack and we prayed for him as a church. I said, my team is praying for you. We don't care what your religion is. But there were times where I wanted to get out of, 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 of that chat, you know, because these guys, <laughs> they're guys, okay? So don't judge them. Don't ridicule them. They will send all kinds of stuff. You know what I mean? You guys know. Every kind of pornography, every kind of dirty joke, all kinds of gods because they, are, they are got all kind of... And there were times where I wanted to just say, I'm so tired of this. I just wanted to get out of the chat. And the Lord strongly said to me, you stay in there because that is my harvest field. That is my harvest field. That is my harvest field. And I don't want you to leave. You do not have permission to walk out of there. Just because you are a preacher now for almost 40 years, you are so sanitized and cleansed and sterile, you don't know how to feel how I feel. So Jesus was speaking to his disciples and he, can I paraphrase what he said? You know, he wasn't looking at the people to condescend and, and to judge them and to condemn them. He didn't look at them with superiority. Why is your life like that? With disdain or ridicule. In Luke chapter 19, verse 10, Jesus said this, The Son of Man came to seek and to save. Luke 19, verse 10. The Son of Man came to seek and to save that which is lost. That's my purpose. I didn't come to, to give you a spiritual massage. How are you feeling today? This is what he was saying to his 12 disciples. Guys, guys, guys. I hope you are seeing what I'm seeing. I hope you get this. This is not about us, 12 guys, sitting down, eating unleavened bread and having wine, talking about who's the Antichrist and what bad things are happening in the world, blaming the Roman Empire and the tyranny and the oppression. Guys, this is not about me. He says, this is about me. I came to seek like a seeking missile. I'm guided by that inner force of my father to save that which is lost. And I hope you get this today. If you think you just came to church so that somebody can give you a spiritual massage on a Sunday, you've lost the plot. If Jesus Christ is your Lord, then the same thing that beats in his heart should beat in your heart. This is what he is saying. This is breaking my heart, guys. I see people trapped, wanting a miracle, a deliverance, an escape, a chance to be forgiven, a blessing, a people full of needs. Do you see what I'm seeing? My mission in life is not just for you 12. My mission in life is for you to look. The harvest is truly plenteous. Truly plenteous. If I just wanted to pamper you and just came to die for you, then the moment you accepted me as your Lord, I would have taken you straight to heaven. Why are you still here? I said to you, you didn't listen to me. Some of you are sitting there looking so glum. I don't know what you had for breakfast, but listen carefully. He said, I didn't come just to save you because if that's all I came to do, you would have gone to heaven straight away. The moment you say, I accept you, Lord Jesus, you would have gone. He said, I came to save you and I want you to be instrumental just like other people I used to reach you and invite you to me. I want you to have that same. That's why you are still here. That's why you are here to be trained. That's why you are here to be challenged and to be toughened up. Jesus was saying they are like sheep without a shepherd. They look like they got it all together. They dress nice, they smell nice, they sound nice, but they are lost sheep. And that's one of the reasons why sometimes I say, God, so many bad things. Where are you? How can this go on in Nigeria? How can 
It's supposedly a Christian nation. How can this go on? When in one day people can crucify and butcher and rape 1,000 Christians and that gets on the news, it doesn't move anybody. Now Nigeria is one of the wealthiest countries in the world. They've got the biggest diamonds and gold. So I'm thinking, why don't they take that money and you know, hire people like Sylvester Stallone or some of these guys. And what's the movie called? Expendables. Get Expendables. Get people like that. You know, go in and shoot these buggers. Blast them. Bring all your Chuck Norris and all these Van Damme. Bring them. You know, pay somebody. Kill these fellas. You know, that's my carnal thinking. Spiritual. <laughs> Spiritual thinking is send missionaries, not mercenaries. <laughs> but I would prefer to send some mercenaries when people do that. I tell you, it really gets me really. I get news twice a day, every day, every day, twice a day. My morning and evening mail of what's happening around the world. And then I think what's happening in India. And I'm thinking, okay. A lot of these people come over to our country to tell us what God wants to do in Malaysia and prophetically, and they are true. They are, they are genuine people. They come, they're, they're, what they say is very good. But I'm thinking, what's up with your country? See, I don't feel called by God to run to India to try to do anything. He said, open your eyes. Your harvest field is here. Pandamaran, Chowkit. We got a church in KL, Pataling Street. Why do I want to go to, to Guangzhou somewhere to try to preach the gospel when there are Chinamen here who are the biggest crooks in the world? The biggest gamblers on British Premier League are the Chinamen from Malaysia. <laughs> Don't mention Tony Fernandez, he's a nice guy. <laughs> so that's my contention. Contention. We want to go over to the other side and look at the other fields like busybodies right here on our ground. Our neighbors. Right here. Joe, don't leave that chat. You are a pastor to this heathen. Love them. Do you see them how I see them? Oh Lord, I see them. I like to give them one. They are my. They are mine. Here. Okay, you're all very quiet now, so I must stop a little bit. <laughs> this is what Jesus is saying. He said, do you see that the harvest is enormous? The harvest is huge. But here's the problem. The harvest is ready. There might be some people who may not be ready, but don't you kid yourself. Oh, pastor, I'm praying for that person never came to church, so I got so hurt, I don't want... Oh, I tried to invite that person, and they hurt me, so I don't want to do inviting people anymore. It's full of potential, Jesus said. Full. So don't you make that excuse, oh, I cannot... You know, it, you are a blatantly disobeying the call of God. I, I cannot go out and talk to them because they are also not ready. Jesus said, stop kidding yourself. Do you see what I see? They're full. They're right. You, you, you touch the tree and they all start falling. They're right. Today I heard uh, how teacher Stanley was teaching his class. And by the way, sometimes guys, you need to go upstairs and watch what's going on. All the classrooms are filled upstairs with children and teachers are teaching, class, you know, classes are going on. And I just love that whole atmosphere. And Stanley was talking about, uh, to the children about Jonah, the prophet Jonah, and uh, how he went to Nineveh. And all he did was, after being vomited out by the, by the whale, he comes out with all this slime all over and the people that he hates the most, and he didn't want to come to them in the first place, he was hoping that God would judge them and punish them. He comes up and he says to them, Repent! 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 Turn to God, He's going to judge you. That's all he said. No three-point sermon, nothing. 
Repent, repent. You're all going to die. God's going to judge you. And they repented. And he got really ticked with God. I was hoping you'd judge them, you know, kill them, these people. And they all repented. And the king of Nineveh repented. And there was a revival. Because one person got vomited out by a fish. Do you need to be swallowed by a big fish? Any volunteers here? To put up your hand. I can arrange for you. This clang, you know, very nearby the sea. Huh? You want something to chew you up? Huh? You know, gastric juices all of... Huh? Crabs climbing up, crunching. The fish is trying to digest this stubborn prophet. No, very hard. A lot of gas going on. A lot of honk. He's trying to pressure cook that prophet, but he cannot, cannot, cannot. Finally, vomits him out. Do, do you want to go through some of that? Huh? You want God? God can arrange your circumstances. I can pray right now, no problem. Yeah. Another hospitalization, some kind of financial problem. <laughs> okay, Lord, now I will really go out to my neighbors. <laughs> I promise you this time, this time. Send me, Lord, please. <laughs> ah. And you stand out all beaten up and broken. Repent, repent. <laughs> huh? He said, the harvest, here's the problem. The problem is not the harvest. The problem is the labor force. They are few. So what can we do about that? Three things Jesus said. Number one, he said, pray. Everybody say, I must pray. pray. Yeah. Now I understand some of you have difficulty coming out on a Friday night or Thursday night for prayer meetings. And I understand that. I've had children who were young too. I know all that going to tuition thing and all of that. But no matter where you are, if you can come for the prayer meeting, all the better because we need you. You don't just need our prayer. We need you to pray. And the Lord is saying, pray what? To whom? The Lord of the harvest. This is his harvest. That's why he never gave me permission to get out of that chat. You have no permission. I put you in there. That's my harvest. They belong. You pray for them. I am the Lord of the harvest. And Jesus said, now you pray. And what do you pray? You pray, God, give us this people. Relentlessly. You pray. You seek them. Jesus said the same way I began to seek them. Now you can only do that kind of thing if you're connected with God. Honestly. If you're seeing what he's seeing, if you're feeling what he's feeling, listen, Jesus said, I am the vine, my father, you are the branches. I am the vine, you are the branches. My father is the gardener. We very seldom see God as a gardener. Let me tell you something. God is almighty God. God is your papa, he is your father. But I also want you to know, for your growth, he is your gardener. He is my gardener. He will come and trim you if you're not bearing fruit. He wants you to bear fruit. In fact, in 2015, I prophesy over you in the name of Jesus, you will have a fruitful year. You will have fruitful lives. You will have fruit in your finances. Oh, please understand. That doesn't mean there won't be any fights or problems. Of course, the Bible said, Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation. You will get bad news. The Bible says that the enemy has formed a weapon against you, but he will not prosper. The weapon is already formed. The Bible says no weapon formed against you. That doesn't mean there's no weapon. It says the weapon, but he said the weapon that is formed. Every weapon that is formed against you, it's already formed. You will have fights. But listen, they will not succeed in taking you down. Are are you listening to this? So here, this is how you do prayer. You stay connected with God. Oh, hallelujah. When you're driving, when you're in the home, when you spend time in your devotions, God, God, save people. God, give us my friends. God, help me, anoint me, make the connection, make the connection. I'm deliberately going out for them. God, 
make the connection. My father, make the connection. Number two, he said, send out, listen, this is very important. Huh? He said, send out laborers, not CEOs. Hello? Not consultants. We don't need consultants in the church. We don't want experts who can talk a lot, do nothing. We don't want mandor supervisors. Why this not done? How come the church are there? Why that didn't happen? Why didn't it? Shut up. He wants only laborers. Are you listening? In the field of God, there are no CEOs, doctors, reverends, datos, none. We all are called laborers. Now, I know not many of us are blue-collar blue jobs here that you, you don't go out there and labor because now, you know, we can hire labor force. But in God's harvest field, listen to me, please, please. Are you listening to me? You are called a laborer. You don't, ex don't expect people to come and say, thank you, please. We tell you, get up, do your job. Oh, boy, pastor tell me to do... He doesn't love me. You're right. <laughs> but Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. And Jesus loves this harvest field here in Klang. Jesus loves those people who should be sitting on our empty chairs. Jesus loves your neighbor. Jesus loves your colleague. Why are they not in this empty chairs? He said, pray that God will send out Laborers. This is what Jesus said in John chapter 9, verse 4 to 5. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night comes and no man can work. Your, your, your day of opportunity will come and go. I like what Leonard, Leonard Ra Ravenhill said. I'll, I'll quote it to you in a little while. You see, when, when we are all classified as laborers, we are called to dig. Some of us use chunkol. Some of us use a spoon. But we are all called to roll up our sleeves, dirty our hands. Sometimes it's bloody. Sometimes it's hot. We are all called. If you are a musician, stop thinking that you are some prima donna, wannabe Led Zeppelin. <laughs> you are not. They have got far better players in the world, you, you, you and I, I, I play music, I'm a singer, I am nothing, I'm just a wannabe. I sing all the songs I didn't write. Matt Monroe sang that song, or Nat King Cole sang, I'm just a wannabe, I'm just an echo, just for the fun of it. But that's not my calling. This, God has called us to be, some of us pretend like we are millionaires. Maybe, maybe you've reached a couple of millions. God isn't impressed by your wealth because He owns everything. He owns everything. It all belongs to Him. He allows us to enjoy it. He's a good heavenly Father. He blesses you when you're faithful. He says, well done. He blesses you some more. But all of that is not so that I can have another seven BMWs and another five Ferraris in my car, in my garage, but so that I can finance the work of the kingdom of God. So I pray that you will be those millionaires. I'm one of those preachers who's not ashamed to say, you follow the procedure that is set in the word of God, you will bear much fruit. You will, there is no ifs about it. You will prosper. And I pray that every one of you, my God, C3 Church, I pray that you will prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. But all that is meant for this one thing and this one thing alone. As long as there is day, I can work. The night comes when you are lying in a hospital bed with seven tubes up your nose and your bum, and while a machine is trying to keep you alive, and the doctor's working frantically, and you can hardly respond by looking at the corner of your, oh, please, I've been through all of that and seen people and prayed for them in hospital. At that time, you want to work. I wish I had a job. I wish I could go home to my wife. I wish I carried my kids and hugged them and kissed them. I wish, Pastor, I really wish I could go to church again. I miss the songs that we used to sing. But what did you do about it? What did you do with all this blessing that's going on here? 
Where did you go? You, whom could you have reached? David said it like this, I will live and I will not die so that I can declare the glory of God. The reason why I'm alive and you're alive and God is gracious is so that we can declare the goodness of the Lord. So I will live, David said, and I will not die. I will live, I will not die. Resurrection, da, 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 alive in me and I am free in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I like the sound, sound effects. Huh? So what's stopping the harvest from being harvested? It's our labor force. Listen, Jesus didn't come to start a church and then give us a mission. He was a man on a mission and then he told the church, come and do my mission. I say that again. He is a man on a mission. He said, now you watch me. Now it's only me. Then it's you. And so we find in scripture, he tells his 12 disciples to do what he did. This is what Levin, uh, Leonard Reven Hill said. The only reason we don't have revival is because we are willing to live without it. Today's church wants to be raptured from responsibility. I want to show you a few pictures of a, of a big uh, ship, uh, a, a, an aircraft carrier. Um, <clears throat> It was called the USS United States. It was designed with the primary missionary to carry long-range bomber aircrafts that could carry a heavy load of, to, to undertake nuclear bombardment missions. It could carry over 15,000 troops. It could travel at a speed no other aircraft carrier could travel. From the Atlantic to the Pacific, it could go so fast it didn't have to be stopped to be refueled. On top of the, of the ship, where like in the Second World War, uh, uh, where the kamikaze planes would crash and destroy the ship, this one was done so well, so that all this, you can, you can Google it, the USS United States. It was built for that. But then it said, it was never used for that purpose. You know what it became? Let's go to the next one. Next slide. Next slide. Now let's go back. After that, that's the architect's drawing of it. That was what it was planned to be, but they never finished it. And so finally what the U.S. government did was, because the war was over, so they thought, and so now let's go to that next slide. It became a cruise ship. It had 600 luxury rooms. It was meant for head of states and top celebrities. It had all kinds of beautiful things on its deck. Swimming pools, theaters, eating areas. People would sit on the deck, drink their pina coladas, smoke cigars. Whether they liked the captain or the staff, they would enjoy foot massage, body massage. It became a cruise liner, and then in 19, uh, 1990s or something, this is where it ended up, just a rotted ship, because it was not built, not built to be a cruise liner. It was built to go out and rescue people from the oppressor. It was built to go out to war. Now, in a battleship, there are no nice showers. You shower, you sleep, because you've only got one mission. You're going out to fight, to rescue people from the oppression of their government. That was what it was built for. But when they turned it around and made it into a cruise ship, Leonard Reven Hill said it this way, The church used to be a lifeboat or a battleship rescuing the perishing. Now she's a cruise ship Recruiting the promising. Are you okay? Everything all right? Are you happy? Yeah, pray for me because I'm going for my next interview and I want God to bless me. Pray for me. Pray for me so that, you know, I will eat more and be a fat chubby pig just in time for Chinese year. Pray for me. Uh, the other day my boss scolded me and pray that I will be not scolded again. Pray for me, me, 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 pray for me. 
So we became a cruise ship sailing along. I'm not comfortable. Why the children's church doesn't have an aircon fixed properly? My taking my children and we are leaving town. If Jesus came into our church here, or let's say he came into our KL church, right? We bought that beautiful building. Do you think he will walk in and say, guys, mission accomplished. Well done, you fellas. You guys are really good faith, fellas. Well done. That's it. You have arrived. Or do you think he will probably say, it's very good. What was all this for? What's all this for? Why did I give you the thumbs up? What's all this for? Why is my house still empty? Again, I'm not trying to condemn anybody here. I'm just saying, as a pastor in the KL church, I love KL. I have to. I love the people in KL. And as a pastor in the church in Klang, I love Klang. I have to. Of course, we can see a lot of things that we are not happy about. But God wants us to love all those that are around us. There are a lot of things that are happening around the world we don't completely understand or agree. For example, in many countries now, they have civil rights. And when a person has civil rights, you must respect their rights. But that doesn't mean that you have to compromise your Bible standards. For example, if America made a law and says, you know, any man can marry a Cocker Spaniel, it's legal. That's their right. By the way, some of you don't know what a Cocker Spaniel is. It's a dog. Because you're looking at me like this. Exactly. Cocker Spaniel. Pastor speaking bad words again. <laughs> okay, that's all right. Man wants to marry whatever up to you. That's your right. But that doesn't mean my right. There are things that are not... Church, please. Our world is changing. You are going to befriend all kinds of people. You have to love them. I have no problem putting my arm around a fella who's got all kinds of issues and saying, you know, Jesus loves you and so do I. No problem. I pray for you. Any good old day. I stand with you. You have a right to live as a human being just like I have to. And I pray for you. I love you in Jesus' name. In a manly kind of love, not like how you think it might be. <laughs> but I pray for you, man. I have no problem. Young people, old people. Isn't it wonderful that in our clan church that people can come in, that they realize we are not a skinny jeans ch church or a, you know, a, a hip hop church or, a, or we want to be a, a, a really trendy, we are a church where you can find old people, young people, big people, small people, rich people, poor people, multicultural, the Bible says in Jesus there's neither male nor female, Jew or Gentile, slave or free, for we are all one. So we're not trying to build a certain kind of an image in our church, we want to build an image that Jesus said, they are my harvest, everyone is welcome, everyone go out and get somebody to come in, that's the kind of thing we are pushing for so we go out of our way final point Jesus said the harvest truly is plentiful the harvest speaks of potential this is what Leonard again Leonard Ravenhill said this the opportunity of a lifetime must be seized within that lifetime of that opportunity I repeat that the opportunity of a lifetime. You've got a chance now. He says, must be seized. You must take advantage of this opportunity while you, that lifetime is still living. A day will come when that lifetime will not be around. That's the time you want to talk to your dad about Jesus and your mom about Jesus and they'll be gone. Oh, I wish. How many people have said this? I wish. I, 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 I was so near, but... But they, they, they always scolded me, so I was afraid. Oh, you poor thing, you were afraid. This person is going to spend eternity in a few moments, and you have a chance to just bring the presence of God in that situation. But you were afraid. 
Afraid of what? Afraid of what? You're not afraid that that person is going to stand before an almighty God and probably never spend eternity with God? Are you not afraid of that? But you're afraid because they might scold you. So there's a potential all around us. And God is a God of potential. And as I said this year, God potentially is going to bless you. What is potential? Potential is something that is very ordinary, substandard, but you give it to God and God can make it a miracle, like five loaves and two fish. That's the potential. But the potential was he fed 5,000 people. What's the potential? Potential is jars of water that Jesus said, take it up now and give it to the main person and, and it turned into very good wine. Ordinary, colorless. There are people all around us who look very like nothing. Did you know that when they get saved, they're going to come into church, they're going to become great Sunday school teachers or worship leaders or preachers and teachers and stewards and people who will serve. Did you know? Look all around. Look at the chairs around. Look at all the empty chairs. Did you know that they are all potential? They are chairs bought a long time by this church for you to fill it. <laughs> Your potential. A potential mother could be sitting there, a potential father, a potential marriage breakup situation, but now are mended, are sitting there because Jesus loves them and heals their broken heart. Potential children in our Sunday school who are abused and probably not paid attention to, potential useless people whom the government said are hopeless, all could be sitting all around here. But look at the chairs, just look all around you. Where are they? So here's the problem, Jesus said. The harvest is plenteous, but the problem is not the harvest or the Lord of the harvest, it's the laborers. We want people to say, I'm here to labor. What can we do? I'm very proud of you and our KL Church in the sense that, that when we wanted to have the Shanghai Glam thing, the first Sunday when we announced it, I mean, we announced it a few weeks before, but the first Sunday when we got up and announced it here and there, it, all the tickets were gone. So you're talking about 150 potential people who will be in the KL church a few weeks from now. And they're non-Christians. Loads of them are bringing their complete unsaved friends booked. And so they're going to be sitting there hearing the gospel, at least for some of them, for the first time in their life. And I thank God for people like you. I really do. What are we going to be doing about this next few months in our church here in Klang? How can you and I say, Lord, as I begin to become so focused on your passion and your mission that you will take care of my desires? Because if I seek first the kingdom of God and made you priority on my agenda about your works, all these things will be added to me. I thank you. I'm going to be a man on a mission. Jesus was a man on fire. He said, I love these people. I'm going to reach out to touch them. I'm going to drive. It's very simple. It's very simple. Firstly, we are all laborers. All of us can work hard. You can tell your story. You don't have to quote scriptures to people. You don't have to say, you know what the Bible said. No, you don't have to. You just tell your story. Listen to me. Tell your story. It doesn't have to be a dramatic story. I once was an ex-murderer and I raped 25 women. And, you know, today I accepted Jesus as my Lord and say, just tell your story. I went to Sunday school, I heard about Jesus, and I accepted Christ. Oh, I came from a Hindu background, a Buddhist background, and I heard about the love of Jesus and I accepted Christ. Nobody can fight with your story. It's your story. What? How can they argue? But, 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 I don't believe. Up to you. The man said, I once was blind, but now I see. How are you going to argue with it? The woman in Samaria at the well, when Jesus told her, I'm going to show you how real worship is. You don't never have to thirst again. You never have to thirst again. This water that I give you is life eternal. Never have to thirst again. Told her all about her story. And she got so excited. She went back to the entire Samaria and brought everybody to come. And the whole city came out. To see Jesus. What did she do? She told her simple story. This was me. This is what I experienced. He was a prophet. 
prophesied over me. My goodness, he told me everything I did. Now, and people rushed out to see him. Uh, I can imagine some of those fellows rushing out to see him. They, they, they'll be nervous, you know, especially some of those guys. If he knows all about her, would he know that I'm the one as well? You know? I better not go. But, you know, people went. People were drawn to Jesus because the woman went and told her story. You have your story. You talk so much about other people's story. Tell your story. <laughs> yeah? Tell your story. This is what Jesus did to me. And I'm glad I'm saved. Amen. Let's close together. Stand together in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Get ready to worship the Lord. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, God. Yeah, yes, yes. To the front. To the front.
them because Jesus loves them and we love them too. People need to feel that. You know when you love somebody it's very hard for them to hate you. You understand? When you keep telling that person you know it's okay. I, sorry I scolded you that day blah 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 all kinds of bad words whatever and I've had that. You know I've had that and uh, you're just cool with them that doesn't mean you're a, you're a soft person. You're strong you just guy had a bad day or has just had a bad life you know <laughs> and you've been saved by the grace of God that doesn't make you better you're just saved so you just say it's okay swallow swallow hard everybody swallow come on try it everybody swallow some hey did you know that there are some people right now in the hospital who can't even swallow I keep reminding myself that they have to have tubes to help them sad isn't it I feel for them I pray for them pray for miracles but today you can swallow try it one more time swallow just thank God that you can swallow after this you're going to swallow a lot right lunch time swallow like an alligator like oh, oh. thank God for that yeah amen yeah rather than people take all the food process it like baby food feed you you might go out and eat some nice mutton or some crab. Some of you might eat a steak or a burger. Bite down. Urgh. I want you to thank God that every opportunity that God has given to us is so that we can reap the harvest that is all around us. Befriend people, love them. Just invite them. Say, come along. Come along, see what God has for us. Now I want to pray for your well-being. Heavenly Father, we realize that we are not on a cruise ship that we are in this battleship that's taking us to war-torn zones where people's lives are being bullied and controlled use us use what we have from our Facebook to our SMS's to our chats to invite someone to love someone use our voices you gave us voice gave us a mouth to talk, help us to use it for the right purpose. Use our finances, prosper us, so that we can have big parties in our house and invite people and love them. Oh God, prosper us indeed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Be seated for a while. I'm gonna yeah, let's give